this whole thing about cycling didn't come overnight. People cycle, people talk about it, people write about it, and now it has been adopted. The planners will have had a lot of time to plan those six, seven hundred kilometers of, uh, of, 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 of bikeways, but I think the, the planners, the government, everybody is listening. So that's where the optimism is, is, is most important. The fifth, fourth quality is love. Love. Huh? And so I asked him, like he, my friend then kept silent for a while. I said, what's about fifth quality? Still love. <laughs> love. Yeah. love because it's love for the people, love for your, that drives you to make better plans. So um, I think as planners here, we all have a lot of love. <laughs> Can I add two more qualities? You need to be very determined and you need to be very persevering when you're a planner. Because you can always build, I'm an architect planner, I can build a building in two, three years, you know. But I think it takes you 30 years to go and shape a city. Mm. So you really need a lot of uh, patience, perseverance and determination. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let's take three more questions. <coughs> Please, you and then you. Um, evening, my name is Vinod, I'm a third year student from Tembusu College. Um, my question is actually open to the panel. So earlier this morning, the Today newspaper ran a commentary piece that compared Singapore to Venice and actually cautioned us against uh, going into decline the way that Venice did, based on, well, three points. Um, the first one is that Venice, like Singapore, was a trading hub. So the discovery of new trading routes might undercut our position as a trading hub. Uh, in our case, he, the, the piece mentioned the Northern Sea Route and the Crow of Isthmus in Thailand. The second point was that the emergence of new financial centers in the region could kind of steal our thunder. And the third point was that internal fissures, issues like inequality, a lack of inclusivity and too rigid uh, an interpretation of meritocracy could unravel us from within. Okay. So I'd be interested to hear the panel's opinion on this comparison, okay. as well as um, how do you think we've performed <coughs> so far in trying to guard against a decline like that? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes? Good evening. I'm Samuel, a second year economics student from Tembusu College. Okay, before I begin my question, I can assure you I'm not a free market ideologue, but this question <laughs> is pretty much related to markets and urban planning. Okay, this question took form in Professor Heng's talk about the necessity of planning to basically achieve optimal outcomes for a certain city. So you cited Mumbai, for example, and this question is open to the entire panel in general. Okay, the necessity of planning presupposes, I, from my perception of economists, that there are market failures somewhere within the process of urban planning. So why is it that living things up to the market is a very bad idea when it comes to urban planning, number one? Number two, what kind of market failures usually exist in urban planning that urban planning seeks to rectify? And number three, how do markets and urban planning interact? This is a very generalized question, of course, but yeah, so those are three questions I have. Thank right. you. So your three questions, basically one question, right? Yes, why, can't we leave, question. why can't we leave the market to do the urban the planning? <laughs> it's just okay, all right. Th third question. Hi, my name is Chien. I'm a second year student from engineering. And um, my question is from actually from Mr. Ku Teng Chai, where you had this very nice graph with the density of the city versus the livability of the city. And um, from the graph, you can see that Singapore, given the density of population density that we have, we're actually very, we are very high up on the livability chart. And my question is basically this. From the same chart, there aren't that many cities with a similar city density as Singapore. With in, in our situation, we have to grapple with this issue of density and with so many people in such a small space, how do we make it livable? But there aren't that many cities which face the same challenges as we do because um, most of the cities were um, less dense and therefore they, they deal with different challenges as we do. In that, in that case, how is Singapore a model that other cities can adopt since the challenges are different? Okay, thank you. So we have three questions. The um, question is, are we in danger of declining like Venice? Um, <laughs> then market forces versus the state planning. And third, um, are we the only high-density livable city? Are there other high-density cities in the world? So maybe we start at this end. Okay. Chai Kiang. I, <clears throat> I, I won't attempt to answer the first question. You can question. pick any question. <laughs> the second question, no good environment comes unplanned throughout history. <clears throat> you call it by any other name, it's still planning. Whether it's a covenant 
and uh, whether it's a uh, uh, village chief um, instructing his, uh, his constituents to do certain things, it's all planned. Every community plans. As long as it's a good environment. <laughs> if you leave it unplanned, well, just look around you, there are a lot of unplanned cities. Um, and the, 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 the chaos. Market, there's no... Well, I'm a, a skeptic of a market. There's no such thing as a, a real market. Nothing is real. <laughs> but uh, look, uh, today we are discussing about about today. These few days they are discussing about the uh, debt ceiling. The what? Debt ceiling. Oh. Debt right. ceiling. Debt ceiling. Debt ceiling. If the if the debt ceiling is not extended, there will be collapse. If Benaki continues, to, well, no longer Benaki now, but continues to print more money, uh, the economy continues to function in a certain way. It's all decisions. It's all individual decisions or collective decisions. Singa when we talk about Singapore, sometimes we say, let the market. What market are you talking about? If Singapore believed in free market, there will be no Singapore today. There will, just now we talked about the Land Acquisition Act. That's no free market. That's a decision to do certain things for the better good of the society. And we did have a free market for land. We, we, we were hard nosed about it, and, uh, and, and that's where we are today. Um, so I don't believe that you should just leave things to the free market. There's, and I believe that there's no such thing as a free market. Um, the, what was the other question? Venice. Yeah, Venice. I know nothing about question, Venice. Question about high density. <laughs> oh, I know. So I read once this thick book that, that talks about salt, the history of salt. And it's very interesting that they, they talk about Venice, the collapse of Venice, with, the, with, with also linked to this whole thing about salt. Um, what was the last question? No, no that's, for, that's for Ting Chai. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm going to exhibit the two qualities he said I should have. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one is that I'm socialistic, <laughs> right? That planners are socialistic, and to a certain extent, it's true. In fact, over uh, uh, over dinner, I was speaking to some of the uh, artist in residence group right, in in in, uh, in Tabusu College. My point is that uh, planning is a government activity. If you look at the history of planning and how planning evolved, it actually started as uh, a protection of the public interest. So those of you who do planning as a town planning course, you will, if you trace the history of planning, that's how planning started. Because it is to protect the public interest. And therefore, it's inevitable that there is a socialistic element in it. All right? uh, secondly, I'm an optimist. All right? I'm an optimist because I do believe that you can tap the market to do social good. I don't think it's one or the other. I think you can use both. If you're clever enough, you can do a great job. And the planner, while the planner is socialistic, must understand market forces to use market forces to achieve your objective. I give you two examples of I agree. both market failure and market using the market yeah. successfully. I give you two examples. One, the first example is that the government does a land sales program. We use the market. We sell land. All right, to the private developer to build. And we know the private developer's objective is to do what? Make right. money, right? But in selling the land to him, I will put in conditions to achieve certain social and planning objectives. Okay? Look at Marina Bay. That is the planner making use of the market to achieve a very fantastic outcome. All those public spaces, the mix of the users, the urban design, the way you shape the city, is all done through planning and urban design guidelines, all right, in the tender conditions. But uh, the private sector, because they want the choice location and they can make money, they come in, but they design it in a way that the city benefits. So I think that is a great example whereby the planners, with a social goal, can tap on the market uh, to effectively get what you want. 